So th these are the subheadings under which we will be talking about today, in fact, okay? So the mean logic behind uh, doing this test is actually is there is a causal relationship between the induced myocardial ischemia and also the left ventricular regional wall motion abnormality. That is the one which is also a part of the ischemic cascade. Why we are talking about it? Because since earlier times as well, uh, there is scientific evidence which has shown there is a relationship between the systolic contraction and also the myocardial blood supply as well. So there has been experimental induction of ischemia, which was again verified by various experiments various studies as well okay as we can see it over here and later on as well uh, there were various imaging studies with using the 2d echoes which was showed again and again that this is very much possible to demonstrate the ischemic cascade so what is the uh, reason what is really happening so what happens is, a lot of times, when there is no flow-limiting stenosis, okay, and you expose such people or such heart, uh, when there is a demand-supply mismatch, you'll start sh showing global contractility problem, or even the systolic wall thickening, or the endocardial excursion is also going to be affected, in fact. So, uh, this is the reason. So, the hypercontractile response to stress may be even sometimes absent or even may be blunted. Blunted when? Due to if there is an advanced age. So, for example, if someone is in 80s, 90s as well, or if someone has taken a beta blocker, even if there is uncontrolled hypertension as well. So, on the basis of physiological stress with flow limiting stenosis, there will be a demand supply mismatch which leads to of course the ischemic cascade we'll speak about it more as well and there can be also associated parameters overlap and sometimes the sequence and the timing of the events may change sometimes it can be a bit early and sometimes even late or sometimes it may not even happen so this is how is the magnitude of ischemia. Ischemia in the sense, so initially, there is of course normal function, which can lead further to progress to perfusion abnormality, later leading to diastolic dysfunction, later to the strain, abnormal DTI, you will be noticing, which can be further noticed later on in terms of visibly abnormal wall motion, which further changes into ECG changes, and then the patient may be having angina, and finally infarction or scar. So this is the reason a lot of times we will be asking, for example, for what happens is, uh, we do ask for is the uh, other tests and all, other tests in the terms of like if we really want to see myocardial perfusion scan. So that's why myocardial perfusion scan is placed really high above compared to all these different tests as well, okay? So this is why whenever you try to see on the terms of temporal sequence of ischemic events when compared to rest versus the stress, this is the order. Order in the sense, so for example, initially you always see the perfusion heterogeneity then there is a metabolic alteration, and then comes is the diastolic dysfunction, then comes the regional dyssynergy, and the, finally the ECG changes, and finally may, there may be the chest pain. So what you are trying to do is, during our test is, we are trying to focus more on the wall motion of normality and also systolic strain. And we all are aware of the perfusion imaging is the nuclear perfusion scan with contrast echo. So this has a wonderful role. Then comes is the role of the PET scan, and then it comes the role of stress echo. So where we see those wall motion abnormalities. And of course, so the for the example, the ECG which is being done, so ECG 
instead of ECG, you can also do the stress ECG as well. So, which is done in terms of ergometry or treadmill stress test done, okay? So, of course, higher you go, they are more specific. Lower you go, they are more sensitive. So, if you say using a perfusion imaging, there is it is normal, it means, yes, you, you can definitely say in a better way that this patient doesn't have any disease. However, the more higher you go, so if you want to say, if truly positive, okay, this patient has a disease. So for those things, stress ECG or stress echo may be better. So do you understand? So that's the rule. So as we said it, stress echo has a role to show the mismatch between the supply and the demand in terms of what are those parameters which we can show them. So we can show there is a reduction in the systolic thickening and with the endocardial excursion or even regional wall motion abnormality which is an accurate predictor of regional ischemia which usually occurs prior to the STT changes. And uh, so you also want to do the elimination of the stress a lot of times. So if there is a rapid normalization of wall motion abnormality, which will depend, of course, on the ischemia severity and duration as well. So typically it can happen, the recovery happens in one to two minutes. And if it is longer, the stern myocardium can really last for days, in fact. So what is the methodology which is used? As I said, it exercise using the treadmill or the bicycle one or the pharmacological one which is done using the various pharmacological agents like the dobutamine, dipyridamol, adenosine. Even pacing can be done. Pacing is done mostly through the transesophageal route. Or there are other various maneuvers as well like the hand grip, steer step, ergovot, ergonobin, or even combination. So you can combine some of these modalities as well. So I'm sure you all can recall about this, right? So what is happening is this gentleman is undergoing the bicycle ergometry and at the same moment we can visualize the echo. So as I was telling, so this is one of the most common form of stress testing which is being used everywhere and it's immensely valuable and prognostic information which we can get it and imaging is done just before and after that. So yes, it's a great test as we said it but it has its Problems as well. Problems in the terms of there can be false uh, tests as well. False negative. False negative means so what happens is uh, we have to see, for example, uh, there are some cases as well in which there can be rapid recovery, in fact. And um, so before you otherwise, so what happens is okay, you did the test and before you could put up do the echo, so there is a resolution. By resolution, I mean is the wall motion abnormality will disappear before the imaging. So what? Uh, so that is why it can sometimes be difficult. And of course, if uh, you can see on the echo, in terms of if there is a late recovery, so definitely it is a very poor prognostic uh, significance. Uh, it normally tends to happen in cases of severe or extensive coronary artery disease. So, for the bicycle uh, ergometry, which we are talking about, so what happens is, if there is, okay, so one question for you all, what types of ergometry you all have come across? So, some of them I already spoke about, but what else? Are you all aware of? So you all can use the chat box and say.
So what will kind of no one? So what kind of stress tests so far you all have seen? So already I showed you some of those examples, which are the different ones. So regarding the bicycle stress test as well, ergometry, I already showed you that picture. So what happens is, the patient can be upright, otherwise even with a 30 degree tilt as well. And you try to keep on accessing or assess the blood pressure response. You can keep on doing at the imaging as well at each stage and of course at the peak workload as well. But the problem with the bike bicycle one is like the workload which is achieved is low and the tolerability can be there as well. These are some of the reasons why pharmacological stress testing is preferred quite a lot. And as I said, it pharmacological means there are two types of them uh, which can be used. One is with the dobutamine, another is with a drug like which is a vasodilator like a adenosine. So dobutamine, as we all are aware, it has multiple receptor effects in the terms of it affects not only the alpha 1 but also beta 1 and beta 2 as well. So it does increases the blood supply and also it tends to affect, of course, the myocardium. Vasodilator effects of the adenosine, as we all are aware, so it tends to affect the coronary arterioles, in fact. Okay. Similarly, the adenosine tends to affect the smooth muscle cell, in fact, and the dobutamine tends to affect the myocytes. And if you want to use a... a the uh, antidote. So, <coughs> for adenosine, we all are very much aware its half life is just a few seconds. For example, for the dubutamine, is pretty long, so that's why you can use a beta blocker, in fact. And if you want to use a stress as well by using these tests, so dubutamine, of course, dubutamine, diapyridamol or adenosine can be used as well. And yeah, um, so there are some contraindications as well. So, for example, for example, for adenosine, if someone is having a low heart rate, ideally you should not. Similarly, if someone is having an asthma, you should not. Dobutamine stress echo, if someone is having a tachycardia or even a hypertension, it's not so ideal. So, it is very important for us to be able to understand what are the indications, what are the contraindications as well, before we order any kind of tests. So there are various more parameters as well, which can help us to understand which is a better or right test for which type of testing. So for example, for the coronary artery disease, if you're trying to think or see for the myocardial ischemia, you can do a exercise or dopamine or dipyridamol as well. And uh, echo, you can do, of course, to see, uh, to have a look for the wall motion abnormality as well. And then comes, for example, you know, if there is someone is a diabetic, hypertensive, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient. So in that, if you are trying to really see the coronary flow reserve, then you can ask for a dipyridamol or even dobutamine or exercise test as well. An echo variable can be PWLED, in fact. Similarly, if you're trying to see for the transmitral gradient, so on the basis of the trans aortic gradient or the pulmonary hypertension as well, these tests are available. So pulmonary hypertension as well, you can still do a exercise test, okay? And, and over here, CWTR, okay? Across the continuous wave, you have to keep on monitoring over here. The seed, uh, for example, for the trans aortic gradient, you have to do the continuous wave, of course, but around the aortic 
because you are trying to see for the trans aortic gradient. So this is very important. So what about those uh, uh, drawbacks which is there associated with the exercise stress? So we did learn that, okay, it's a very nice, wonderful test, but it does have its own um, problems, which is not associated with the pharmacological stressor or the pharmacological stress test. Because, for example, on the parameters of hyperventilation, or the hypercontractility of the normal walls, otherwise false negative post stress imaging, otherwise excessive chest wall motion movements. Even uh, the, there will be a lot of people who will be complaining of the uh, uh, like uh, uh, pain in the knee joints, they are not able to run, or they have a very um, uh, skeletal deformity due to which they are unable to walk as well. So, pharmacological stress testing is indeed very much important. So, the pharmacological stress is preferred in various conditions. And those conditions, for example, especially as I was telling you, is someone is not able to exercise well, okay, if there is specific indications in terms of you want to rule out or see for the myocardial viability or you want to detect for the detection of the coronary spasm in terms of ergonovene testing in fact as well okay and uh, if you also want to see for the interpretation of the regional wall motion abnormality so for example which segment is getting affected with the regional wall motion abnormality otherwise you do want to see the application of new technologies for example like the tissue doppler or even the contrast echo as well so even in these pharmacological ones, there are different types of testing preferred for different subsets in terms of if someone is a hypertensive, so then you will prefer a diperitimal stress. In fact, otherwise someone is having atrial or ventricular arrhythmias, again you will prefer the diperitimal. However, if we do have a patient of a Wenkeback AV block, otherwise a bronchospastic disease, so for example, asthmatic, so better do a dobutamine stress echo. Okay. Then similarly, uh, uh, someone has been taking a caffeinated uh, a drink as well, like tea, coffee, or even cola. So for such kind of patients, you're going to prefer the dobutamine stress echo, in fact. So regarding the different safety and hazards, there are several studies which is already in place. So, they try to, uh, these studies as you may see, they have tried to see for the comparison of the different uh, serious effects of the fetal MI. As you may notice still, only with the diperidomol, there has been uh, like some of them which has been there in fact. And again, for the bronchospasm, of course, it is more common associated with the diperidomol in fact yeah and when we try to see for other side effects like the chest pain dizziness or dyspnea as well it is more with the diperidomol rather than other ones okay so we should try to also see for the different side effects or the different endpoints what we are trying to think for so those are the things which is going to definitely help us. So even when we try to go through these different studies, definitely pharmacological stress is reasonably safe and also the, ph the physical stress with exercise is safer than the pharmacological testing. So what is the protocol which is being used? So different time intervals, keeping in a view of the weight of the patient, different time intervals, you keep on altering the dobutamine dose, okay? And you try to achieve what is called as a target heart rate. Target heart rate is 220 minus age into 0.85, okay? So that's what you try to do. And in that, you know, 
so you should try to make sure so this is like a normal preparation so the patient should be ready for the standard stress testing you would get a iv access as well digital images are always acquired at the baseline because we want to do the comparison right later on what is happening what is not so you should you must record the vitals vitals especially like the ecg and the blood pressure monitoring as well it should be done and a dobutamine infusion should be started from a minimum of five or at the most like 10 microgram per kg per minute okay and it is increased gradually every three minutes for example if it was started at five or ten then go to 10 20 30 40 in fact and you keep on measuring the echocardiogram the ecg and also the blood pressure in fact and the low dose images are acquired either at 5 or 10 microgram per kg per minute and that is the first sign for increased contractility and you may also keep atropin ampules as well uh, on the side wise so for example when you can use it okay to if you are not able to achieve the target heart rate and you are almost there so just use one of them okay and uh, the mid doses images can be acquired even at 20 to 30 micrograms per minute but as i said it uh, so we start from the five we keep on gradually going up 5 10 20 30 40 like that and uh, after you have gone to the baseline as well in the end you can uh, acquire those images at the baseline and you have to keep on monitoring the patient till the time patient comes to the baseline images a lot of times you must stop the test stop the test earlier and when is that so you must stop them uh, when you have already of course exceeded the target heart rate and otherwise the patient is having a significant angina or even a new regional wall motion abnormality otherwise like a typical stress test like if there is a drop in the systolic blood pressure of more than 20 millimeters of mercury from the baseline you should stop otherwise if the patient develops several arrhythmias several arrhythmias i mean is af nsvd you know, non-sustained ventricular tachycardias as well and otherwise there are some side effects and symptoms so you must stop so we already spoke about the most commonly used word i'm sorry <laughs> So the most commonly used uh, pharmacological agent, for example, which is with dobutamine. So when dipyridamol protocol is quite a lot used well. So it is also a bit similar in the terms of like you at different time intervals, you keep on giving the infusion and you keep on checking using the 12 lead or uh, single lead ECG and keep on checking those echo images. What or how is it happening till the end? Similarly, the other not so oftenly used is called as Argonovian protocol. So in that as well, it has two different protocols, the classical or the modified protocol. Okay, so at different time intervals, you keep on looking for the blood pressure, the ECG monitoring, and also you can keep on looking if there is any inducible vasospasm as well. Now coming to a very important question, about the image acquisition so the traditional way has been you try to use it uh, in the good views and those good views normally where you achieve is in terms of plaques parasternal long axis parasternal short axis apical four chamber and apical two chamber views as well yes if you need other views may be used as well and by convention uh, normally at least four quadrant views of the above four views are compiled and during the comparison always you must keep each view side by side okay so these are the different views which you as i said parasternal long axis parasternal short axis apical four chamber and apical two chamber okay apical four chamber apical two chamber parasternal 
long axis, parasitoid on short axis, okay. So during the rest, the post exercise, like this. Because we are depending on the images which we can acquire from the patient, so it is very important to look at the ventricle, left ventricle, but not at the left atrium. And we must ensure and the pre and post views are same, okay? And we should acquire them in inspiration or even exhalation as well. And optimize for the positioning using the sample plenty of cycles. So you keep on having um, not just two or three cycles, I would say keep on having a look like at least on multiple cycles. And yes, don't try to use overgain. Overgain, uh, especially in the near field, because it will cause problems for the quality acquisition of images. And don't foreshorten the LV cavity. And remember, uh, for the sake of speed, don't forget the quality. So that's very important. So what do we notice? So for example, in this, uh, we are using the excess gain setting. So, in, so this is the one which is, of course, spoiling the endocardial border definition. So, for example, where is the endocardial border definition? It is difficult to notice, right? So, this is the good one, but over here is the excessive gain setting. So, this is difficult to say. Where is the endocardial border visualization? So, similarly looking, but different views. So what are the different views? So what is happening is the chamber which we are trying to focus upon. So we must be able to focus upon those chambers in a good way. It should not be, it's not nice. So if you mix them up in fact as well. So yeah, uh, being a tool dependent, it's there are some quality issues as well in terms of like suboptimal visualization. I've had a lot of times inability to visualize more than one segment. So as we already said about the contrast echo in the stress echo segment, there's LV opacification by microbubbles, which tends to improve the wall motion defects. And otherwise, the simultaneous perfusion analysis, when it's done, it tends to target approach to assess the wall motions, in fact. So when we are trying to have a look over here, especially in the contrast echo, it tends to improve the endocardial border definitions. Do we see this? So this is something real nice over here, what we can see. So the wall motion abnormality categorization. So. Uh, in terms of like, yes, uh, the thing is, there are different wall motion abnormality levels which you can see hypokinesia. So what is hypokinesia? It's the mildest form of wall motion abnormality so in which there's just a little preserved systolic thickening and inward endocardial excursion. So there are various definitions for that. So like less than 30% systolic thickening is there and less than five millimeter endocardial excursion. So yes, the distinction from the normal is subtle. So hypokinesis can be truly abnormal as well if it tends to correspond to a coronary territory. So you should be careful whenever you're talking like, is it um, they are only for coronary territory, okay? Then for example, for the akinesis. So for the, for the akinesis, there are various definitions in terms of if there is an absence of systolic myocardial thickening and endocardial excursion. And if the thickening uh, is there, you should, you must measure the endocardial excursion as well. Then comes is the dyskinesia. Dyskinesia is the, uh, as, I, as we said it, hypokinesia, then comes akinesia, then comes is dyskinesia. Dyskinesia is the systolic thinning and systolic outward bulging, okay? So don't forget these terms and don't mix it. 
hypokinesia, akinesia, and dyskinesia. So whenever there is systolic, uh, of course there is systolic thinning and systolic outward bulging in fact. And there can be scar as well, so which is completely akinetic or even severely hypokinetic or even dyskinetic as well. Something else is called as tardokinesis. This is an important thing. So what is tardokinesis? Tardokinesis is actually a form of hypokinesis in which there is delayed systolic thickening or inward motion. And yeah, a lot of times it may be reported as false negative. So to avoid the error, you must analyze frame by frame. So whenever you are trying to go through those images and all, you should you must always go through frame by frame analysis and then comment about it. So sometimes you may also come across what is called as early relaxation. So early relaxation is mostly like a, a normal variant, but it doesn't show any, of course, any ischemia. But what happens is there is a normal contracting segment in the early systole, so which tends to relax early. So a lot of times it can be reported as false positive. So if you want to again um, uh, a report or to, if you are trying to avoid the error for this, so you should try to analyze frame by frame. So that's very important, frame by frame analysis of the images which is being acquired. And you should trim the cine loop to include the first half of the systole. Okay. So, how do you see for the response to the stress? So, as I was telling you, either you can say normal, normal, normal segments with hypercontractile or stress. You can uh, call it in terms of ischemia when there is normal segment with wall motion abnormality on stress. So, initially it was normal, and later on there is wash wall motion abnormality, but only on stress. Okay, then comes the third portion what is called as the prior non-transmural infarct with ischemia. So what happens is initially there is already a hypokinetic area which tends to worsen on the stress. Otherwise, of course, there can be an infarct or scar. What is? So for example, there is a dyskinetic segment, of course, which is worsening on the stress as well. A lot of times, yes, uh, there can be a normal segment which doesn't change at all on the stress. So it can be either a, it can be abnormal. So abnormal in terms of when it is for ischemia, it can be false positive as well sometimes, and also due to lack of hypokinesis in terms of like if there is a low workload, otherwise there is a delayed post trust imaging. Otherwise, if someone is already on the beta blockade or the cardiomyopathy or elderly females as well. So when someone is on the hypokinetic segment, who tends to improve on stress so for example for the exercise stress so it can be either reported normal otherwise also localized abnormality which is improved by tethering or adjacent myocardial pull and dobutamin stress so which may indicate viability which is for example for the potential for the revascularization so whenever you are seeing in terms of the hypokinetic segment that may improve on the stress so that's why I was telling you, always try to, for example, have try to have a baseline, okay, the resting function. So then how is the response, for example, on the low dose and of course, at the peak or the post-stress function. So when there is a viable but non-ischemic tissue, okay, so what is going to happen is, even if they're on the baseline, there's wall motion abnormality, there will be an improvement on the peak stress. So that's why you, then you can call it as viable but non-ischemic. What is viable but ischemic? Viable ischemic, what will happen is you see that at low dose there is improvement, but at high dose there is reduction. So compared with the low dose. So that is why you will call it as ischemic, viable ischemic. Okay. So this is very important. So how is the response uh, on stress later on? Okay. So now coming to this. 
so as we were telling about the this different segments okay how do they look like then on the low dosage as well then on the high dosage as well so for example if you will be looking like this low dose and then all the high dose okay so this will be you can term it as normal so but what is happening is at the baseline there was a thickening okay then at low dose as well it was thickening but later on there is thinning right so this will be called as so what type of finding is it So what did we learn? So no one so what happens is this is what is called as the hibernating myocardium hibernating myocardium the thing is we should be uh, so it will need a we should vascularize them in fact okay so that's why it is very very important for that So this segment, which is pretty a, a bit opposite of the previous one of the segments, which we had already shown you, okay. So this is hibernation plus ischemia, and finally is of course scar, right? So about the wall motion abnormality scoring, as we had already said it to you, is. that in the different segments, when you are trying to have a look over here, so you should be able to see. So what do you try to see over here is? So first of all, you try to see, is it normal? If normal, you give a score of one. If it is hypokinetic, you give a score of two. If it is akinetic, 3. Otherwise, if it is dyskinetic, it's 4. And the, those different segments are, are different. Uh, they are color-coded as different colors. Yeah, it is up to you guys, like you know, guys and girls, of course, uh, which color you want to use for which one. In the terms of, in the sense like, uh, as you can see it already over here, you can color code for LED, LCX, and RC territory, and then on the basis of, as we already said it, long axis, short axis, parasternal long axis, parasternal short axis, apical four chamber, four, two chamber view. And in those areas, we all are aware, anterior wall, inferior wall, right? Anterior wall will be for the LED ter territory, and inferior wall will be for the PDA. In the four chamber view, we all are aware, base mid apex so here the base will be for the rca lcx and this so even in the short axis parasternal short axis we or i hope you all are remember sepla right septum inferior posterior lateral anterior so on the basis of that you can of course tell about the possible coronary vascular territories as well. So that is very important to be able to comment 
especially using the 16 or 17 segment model. It's already endorsed by the American Society of Echocardiography as well. <coughs> so which you can already see it over here. The different segments are very well uh, written over here. I would really like you guys to focus, have a look on this in fact, and because this is very important. This is really important. So whenever an echo image is being interpreted or being commented upon, in fact. So there is something is called as wall motion score index as well. So how it is being uh, scored upon. So is it one or is it, you know, one at the same baseline and also a stress, otherwise if there is no ischemia as well. And then you try to see for the contents of the stress echo report as well. In terms of that, you try to see, as you can see, how about those resting images, and then you have to comment about the different subheadings, similarly stress response, then again you have to comment about the different subheadings, about the stress images as well, then again the different subheadings, and finally about the conclusion. In the conclusion as well you have to comment about the presence and extent of infarction, viability, and blah 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 blah. Okay? So, uh, about the localization, as we had already said it, yes, it is a pretty sensitive test. So, you will be able to uh, comment as well, but with different levels in the terms of like this. For the se severity of the coronary artery disease, you can, yeah, mostly comment about those LED, then comes is the RC, then comes the LCX. <coughs> so, wall motion abnormality is definitely more sensitive. And uh, if someone is especially not having the painless ischemia, in fact, so that is the reason a lot of times if there are uh, young women in which, uh, so for example, if there is a low risk group, uh, it may not be the ideal test, okay. So there was already a study which was done uh, when they tried to see how does it do way back in 1993 as well. So it does have a good predictive value, okay, as we can see it over here. So, in simple terms, in most of the cases, yes, stress ECG and echo is really good. However, if they do disagree, then of course you have to uh, trust the echo, in fact, rather than the ECG, in fact. And yeah, um, if there is marked positive stress test even with the ECG, with the symptoms, you should not ignore it, of course, yeah. So, as we already said it, for the detection of the coronary artery disease, you must, uh, the regional wall motion abnormality is a very good marker, and false negativity, uh, we should try to rule it out, especially if someone is a hypertensive or there is a concentric remodeling as well, and in terms of the sensitivity, okay, as we already said this thing, and about the coronary artery disease as well, this is how we should try to follow. So, bigger is the area, for example, LED has the biggest area, right? So, we have to uh, trust this if we get a uh, regional wall motion abnormality in the territory of the LED, in fact. And overall, uh, specificity is like 75 to 90 percent. And as we had already said it, whenever in doubt in terms of stress testing with the pharmacological, otherwise with the running, you should trust this one, in fact. And yes, there can be some false positive people as well. So, so, so for example, in terms of uh, like uh, pulmonary hypertensives, otherwise left bundle branch block patients, or either, even in cases of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients as well. Uh, there are several studies which try to even compare with the myocardial perfusion scan using the SPECT single photon emission computed tomography scan. So, there is a good, uh, very good degree of concordance, in fact. Yes, nuclear myocardial perfusion amazing is more sensitive. However, if you want to see in terms of specificity, stress echo is more better in terms of that. And uh, exercise stress test, of course, has more uh, robust data as well. 
and that's what they tried to show in the further studies by like Narvik or even Buzis at all as well. Wonderful demonstration of the kaplan meyer curve. How was the events? So for in the patients who have ha had a dubutamine stress echo have higher events rate, okay? Similarly, the no if someone has had a normal dubutamine stress echo, so they will be having a more modest event-free survival, okay? And if someone is being referred for the dubutamine stress, especially with relatively worse prognosis at baseline, and there's inability to exercise, it is an ominous sign, in fact. So, to adding a contrast perfusion echo to the vitamin stress echo, of course, it increases its prognostic value in a very significant way. So, if someone is already having a heart attack, has had a heart attack, so there will be, of course, a resting regional wall motion abnormality, and you are trying to see for this identify at a distance, okay, about the inducible ischemia, then you can do a dubutamin stress echo test even after post-MI as well. And you can predict cardiovascular events even better than the angiographic uh, values. So this was a paper by Carlos et al. And it was a great paper, in fact. So it can also be used for the pre-op risk assessment. So a lot of times those... Um, patients who are supposed to undergo a knee replacement surgery. So those are the people who will undergo such kind of testing and it will be very helpful as well. And regarding the risk of perioperative cardiovascular events, as we said it, so the positive predictive value of this test is very important. So there has been uh, various studies also about the viable myocardium, viable myocardium that has potential for functional recovery, which is called as the stunt or hibernating. So, okay, so that, in that as well, uh, it has a very good role, of course, and uh, uh, as I was telling you, so what happens is, uh, whenever you do the dubitamin stress echo, two things you may see, either viable or non-viable. Viable myocardium, the contractility augments on beta adrenergic stimulation. However, the non viable myocardium, there's no augmentation at all. You may be able to see the biphasic response. Biphasic response, what will happen is it is the most predictive of functional recovery after the revascularization. And what happens is there's sustained improvement or no change that tends to correlate with the non-viability, okay? So this is again what is being shown over here in the post-myocardial infarction versus the ischemic cardiomyopathy. So in that, again, SPECT or PET seems to be more uh, higher sensitive, in fact. So... I wish uh, these videos would have been playing, then I could have shown you in a much better way. So even in terms of uh, various valvular disease, stress echo has a role, especially if there is a borderline severe case of, for example, of metal stenosis, when the symptoms don't match the objective evidence. So that is the time you should try to think for ordering a supine bicycle ergometer, in fact. Okay. Otherwise, similarly, if there is a low gradient but severe aortic stenosis patient. So in that, if there is increase in the flow rate, will normally, of course, increase the valve area as well. But you don't use a high dose. So you always use this low to mid dose. So starting from the 5, you can go up to 20. So then what happens is, uh, for a truly severe aortic stenosis, the LVOT to aortic valve peak jet velocity ratio is, remains unchanged. And then there is something what is called as a pseudo severe aortic stenosis or cardiomyopathy, in which the area increases to more than one square centimeter. 
okay and here the lvot to av peak velocity ratio tends to decrease in fact so what happens is uh, in the diastolic dysfunction there is early and sensitive marker only for ischemia but may also be quantitatively impaired okay and sometimes you may also notice the post systolic shortening in terms of what is called as the ischemic memory okay and sometimes yes it can be less reproducible so that's why it is not so standardized so what did we learn from the today's extensive session so to make, make you understand in a simple way pharmacological stress echo is a wonderful test it is pretty safe informative cost effective and uh, you can also make alterations you can also combine it with the other tests as well and you can get very nice results but yes there's still scope for some improvement whenever you are talking in terms of diagnostic or even prognostic purposes as well so do you guys have some uh, questions so far so these are some bonus slides with that how you can notice especially when you are trying to apply the strain rate on the different infusion patterns so in the low dose high dose 